Wonderful. Welcome, everyone. Great to see you all for this third of our debates in, the, in our series, What If? Radical and Inspiring Ideas for Alternative Education Futures. And we're delighted to be running these in association with the TES. As usual, I introduce Ed Doral here in the front row. Um, you'll find recordings of previous debates on our website, and we've had a really tremendous response from social media, so it's wonderful. You can catch up with this on the live stream. First of all, um, just a couple of housekeeping matters. For those of you who like to tweet, you'll find the uh, Wi-Fi login instructions on your seats, and those watching via the live stream can submit questions as well for the panel via the hashtag #IOEDebates. We're not expecting a fire drill, so if the alarm sounds, please do take the doors behind you, turn right, and our fire marshals will guide you out onto Bedford Way, or if necessary, down a floor so that you can exit out of the back of the building. And to the debate. This evening, we're looking at teaching. Of course, as you all know, it's one of the most important vocations out there. At least in theory, one of the most rewarding struggling to recruit teachers and to retain them. And we're now, once again, talking of a crisis in teaching supply. Given what we know about the importance of teaching quality for student experiences and outcomes, that that teaching quality is doubly important to the outcomes of kids from disadvantaged backgrounds, this is really a major issue for social justice and equality of opportunity in addition to, of course, being crucial for the overall excellence of our education system. Now, things are being done. Um, routes on workload, on career pathways. Many schools, um, trusts, local authorities are working with innovative ideas. We read Tez just the other day about chain's approach to um, providing accommodation on site and so on, and some of these innovations are being tested in different ways. Is this enough? Is it time for a more radical rethink of teaching as a career? What might a more attractive proposition for future teachers look like? So, to respond to those questions, we have Mary Bowstead. Since the 1st of September, Mary's been Joint General Secretary of the National Education Union, the largest education union in Europe, formed through the merger of the Association of Teachers and Lecturers and the National Union of Teachers. Prior to that, of course, Mary was General Secretary of the ATL and the Association of Managers in Education. Mary's a leading commentator on issues affecting teachers, representing NEU's members to policymakers and through her regular media appearances more widely. As well as having served as a teacher in North London Comprehensives, Mary's also had experience of teacher training, having worked at York, Edgefield, and Kingston Universities. Jonathan Simons, at this end, is Director of Policy and Advocacy at the Mark Varkey Foundation, an organisation focused on improving the way teachers are trained, perceived and recognised, something that comes across very clearly in its annual Global Teacher Prize and its $1 million uh, award. Previously, Jonathan was Head of Education at the Think Tank Policy Exchange, and he's also worked at Serco Group, the Cabinet Office and the Prime Minister's Strategy Unit. He's Chair of Governors and Co-Founder of the Greenwich Free School and Trustee of Astria Multi-Academy Trust and Ambition School Leadership. Lucy Crean's biography describes her as an education explorer, which is a great description. Having taught in a London secondary school, Lucy went on to work in schools in six top-performing education systems, and that put, formed the basis for her book, Clever Lens, The Secret Behind the Success of the World's Education Superpowers, which was one of The Economist's book of the year for 2016. And Lucy's continued to advise governments internationally on education, most recently working with UNESCO on teacher career structures. 
And Martin Mills is currently head of the School of Education at the University of Queensland, Australia. But I'm delighted to say that in January, Professor Mills will be joining us officially as director of our new flagship research centre, the Teachers and Teaching Research Centre. And Martin's scholarship is wide-ranging, encompassing social, justi social justice, pedagogies, school reform, teachers' work, alternative education, and gender and education. One of his recent books, Reimagining Schooling for Education, considers what supportive schooling contexts for both school students and teachers might look like. So I think we've got brilliant panellists in the room to address the question for today. We look forward to hearing from them. I'll turn to Mary to make a start. Thank you, Becky. Can you hear me? I'm uh, sorry, I've got a cold, so you just have to... I, my noise isn't normally husky like this, but that's what we've got today. <laughs> so um, I'd start with this obvious... It's obvious to everyone now, despite Nick Gibb can say as much as he likes, crisis, what crisis? We do have a crisis in teacher supply, both in teacher recruitment and retention. So we learned uh, last week that the government's missed its teacher training targets for the fifth year in a row and that 17 out of the 20 secondary subjects uh, aren't recruiting to target. Design technology is terrible. It's been terrible for well only 33% of its required trainees. But we don't just have a problem with recruitment. We also have a problem with retention. And when it comes to good, you know, high-performing um, uh, education systems, England is a complete outlier. So 52% of our teachers leave before they've been in the classroom for 10 years. So under half... Our teachers, to put it another way, have been in the classroom for more than 10 years. And that's a massive wastage rate. And what that creates massive problems because what it means is that not only do we struggle, £700 million a year the government pays to uh, put into teacher training and recruitment, um, but that's wasted. Uh, you know, 26% leave after three years and over 50% leave by 10 years. And that means not only are we running to stand still or running to move backwards gradually, but also, it means that uh, the supply line through from beginning teachers to middle management to senior leadership is broken, and that creates real problems in school, as beginning teachers tell me too often they are given far too quickly responsibilities which they can't do because they don't have the training, they don't have the experience. It also means uh, that standards of our education systems suffer. So when you find that one in five maths and English lessons are taught by teachers um, who aren't qualified to teach those subjects, you can see that the very core of the curriculum um, is being affected, and that really affects progress, particularly at Key Stage 3, 11 to 14, because school leaders make entirely reasonable decisions to put the qualified teachers at Key Stage 4 and Key Stage 5, and then they're not the, in the early years of secondary schools. That's probably, I think, one of the reasons why we don't make the progress that we should do in the early years. So if we we're going to make a wave of magic wand and we we're going to transform teaching to career choice, I do think we need to look at jurisdictions which do it better and think about what we need to do. We need to look internationally for this. And I'm going to quote Andrew Schleicher, who's head of the OECD, the guru behind the Pisa League tables, and he remarked recently when he came to the UK, Finland doesn't pay its teachers much better than Britain. So why do nine people apply for every place in teacher education? Because the job is interesting. The profile of activity is more similar to other professional workers. The idea that you spend all your time teaching is still an industrial model. Someone tells you what to do and you just go and do it. The Japanese or Finnish model is more professional, or the Shanghai model, where teachers get more time out of the classroom to do the thinking about teaching, to do the planning, the preparation, to work with one another, and crucially, to talk to each other about assessment. There was a report out this week from Pearson's, LKMO, LKMO and Pearson's, which said that actually teachers in England are reporting that they are very underconfident in formative assessment. Uh, formative assessment, to me, is the key. It's the, it's the basis of effective teaching practice. And the reason that they're underconfident is because we put so much emphasis on summative assessment, on teaching to the test, making summative assessment the, the goal, which doesn't allow us to get the fine-grained information we need about student progress, and teachers don't get enough experience, and formative assessment doesn't matter enough in the system. So we need teachers to spend less time teaching and more time becoming expert at teaching and thinking about teaching and have a vocabulary to describe their teaching. 
I think there's also an issue with schools. And uh, I think that in too many schools now, uh, teaching has become, uh, uh, teachers are working in workplaces which are compliant rather than collaborative institutions. And teacher voice is not being heard, particularly about those issues where teachers are expert. Issues around what the curriculum, how the curriculum is being received. What are the challenges to understanding and to learning? What progress are pupils making? And how does the school day need to be organised? And how do things like data collection and uh, the timetable and the curriculum and assessments need to be organised in order to maximise pupil progress? In too many schools, I feel, these decisions are made by senior leaders without enough reference to the teaching staff. And often, my members tell me, and this came through in the LKMO Pearson report, that means hours and hours and hours using dodgy data to demonstrate progression when it doesn't actually stack up. So in other words, the meeting round progression and the data becomes more important than when the progression has actually taken place. Progression becomes subordinate to the data around progression. And I think we have schools which are drowning in data, much of it dodgy, um, being used for an accountability system, which actually now the inspectors go in and look at the data rather than look at the school and the quality of teaching and learning. So data assumes an importance which destroys proper conversations and proper expertise about teaching and learning. So we need schools to be collaborative institutions where senior leaders, and Andrew Schleicher talks about this, harvest their teachers' professional knowledge, value it, and where teachers' voices are heard. That leads me to the next point, which is continuing professional development. The average number of days of CPD in England, in the UK, are 4.5. The average number across good performing systems are 10.5. In Shanghai, it's 40 days a year. We need, I still think we're in the same position we were in 2005 when Ofsted did the logical chain about CPD, when they said that CPD is dried up on the demand side and on the supply side. And when you talk to teachers, most of them will say they get generic CPD, which does not give them the information, the knowledge, and develop the skills and abilities that they want. The secondary teachers, a lot of that is around subject-based CPD. I know that Dylan Williams says you don't need subject, but I don't agree. I think you do need subject-based CPD. And, for, and all teachers need much more detailed CPD around assessment and formative assessment. So we need effective continuing professional development, and we need much more than four and a half days. I'll do two more things. I've got 33 seconds left. <laughs> the next one is government policy. So what do the OECD say about effective government policy reform? Uh, policymakers need to build consensus about the aims of education reform. They need to involve the profession in formulating policy and policy responses. All political players need to have realistic expectations about the pace and the nature of reforms to improve outcomes. And reforms need to be backed by sustainable financing. And I would say that current and previous governments, and this is just a pop at the Tories, but it's also a pop at Labour, none of those uh, requirements have been uh, Honoured. We've had reform which has been unsustainable, unfinanced, unfocused and unfinished. And teachers are left to just constantly pick up the pieces. And finally, if you're going to make teaching an attractive profession, you can't have teachers afraid of well, last week's TMS of being homeless. We've got to pay teachers properly. <laughs> Mary, thank you. Now, with a bit more of a, 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 an international perspective, Martin Mills. Yeah, thanks, Becky. What if we wanted to transform teaching as a career choice? I love the question, but in particular, I love the STEM. What if? If I had my way, what if would drive curriculum in schools, it would drive curricula in universities. It's what if questions that have led to every major breakthrough in science, the arts, literature. I think we have to ask those questions. So I love, I love this, this debate. Before I say what I want to say about transforming teaching as a career choice, I do want to give a, a prologue in the sense that I don't think this conversation can occur without some consideration of questions about what kind of society do we want to live in? What do we do about addressing deep social and economic inequalities in our society? How do we, as people, want to engage with each other? How do we want to engage with others, for example, refugees? I think those questions sit as a backdrop to what I want to say about um, 
about the question. So in the interest of brevity, I'm not going to touch on some of those questions, but keep them in the back of our, our mind. I'm going to just make three, I guess, brief points, very brief points, about teachers teaching and teacher education. I was thinking about it on the, on the plane, on the, on the way over. And you know there's that, that moment when they run through all the things you have to do if the plane crashes, and you think, I hope I never have to listen to this, really. And there's one part where the oxygen mask drops down, and it then tells you, and there's a, there's, in the picture I could see there was a woman and a little child, put your mask on first. And the reason that you put your mask on first rather than on the child's is because you cannot help the child if you, have, if you haven't got enough oxygen. And I think it's the same in schools. I'm committed to student voice. I'm committed to ensuring that marginalised students get the best education possible. But unless teachers are given the oxygen, unless we take account of teachers' welfare, then I think we don't actually provide teachers the opportunity to address those, those needs of their students. So for me, that's always at the heart of, of my work, is thinking about the welfare of teachers. I think in England, and I'd, I'd say the same in Australia, that we don't pay enough attention to that. I've set up a, a Google alert for England education, and I hit, get hit nearly every day about some issue around teacher shortage, teacher retention. Outside my office, there are you know, posters galore, teach in the UK. In fact, my daughter came and taught on the South Coast in an academy for a year. The stories I could tell, but I have four minutes now. Um, so look, and I think about teacher welfare, I love the notion at, that we push and we sent, put teachers really central in this, in this debate. I think it's really important. I do have concerns about the way in which someone like John Hattie's work has been taken up and the argument that teachers make the difference. What rubbish? Teachers make a significant difference. They are crucial. But the economic policies around, around schools and around teachers are critical to ensuring that teachers can make, make a difference. I think if we want to transform teaching as a career choice, we have to enable teachers to be seen as an intellectual worker, as intellectual labour. The nature of teaching is such, and I was, was a high school teacher and I've sat in so many classrooms that I've just been blown away by. And that is intellectual work, as teachers work out how to transform curricula into the students in their classrooms, how to take account of the particular context in which they're, they're operating. It's also emotional labour. I know from my own teaching experience, having you know, a student commit suicide, having a, a staff member killed in an accident, seeing all the, those kinds of traumas, kids who are homeless, who come to you and say, I don't know where I'm going to be sleeping tonight. Those are real issues that impact upon teachers. I think we have to see their work as really, really significant and as making a difference to students' lives. I think, and, and as Becky Allen has said and as, as Mary has said, I think that we have to trust teachers more, that one of the real problems is a distrust of, of teachers. I look forward to the day, you know, and, and I guess I was as kind of a what if, that some poor, you know, PISA results come out and the government's response is, let's go and talk to the teachers to find out what to do. What supports do you need? How can we help you? Right? rather than kind of the, the big stick approach that we experience in Australia and, and we experience here. I think we do have to think about the nature of, of teaching and what teaching looks like, and I think that will help to transform teaching. I, I've been reading some of the, the Morris Holt stuff lately on slow education and slow schooling, and that we do need to take our education slowly, and the Ted Sizer notion of less is more. We are in an incredibly fast-paced education system where all we're concerned about are what are the results at the end of this year. Um, I, I know that people will probably talk about Finland. They took their time. That's what kind of nation do we want to be? What kind of education system do we want to be that kind of nation? So I think we have to, rather than fast conversations, we need some slow conversations about, about this topic as well. Um, I've got a lot of points here that Mary said, so I might leap, leap over those. Mm -hmm. I, I, <laughs> um, I, in terms of the slow conversation and, 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 and slow education, for me, teacher education is really crucial. And a couple of times I heard the word teacher training I would get rid of that word training right here and now and hope that we don't ever use that again in the context of teacher education. We cannot train teachers. 
the training teachers kind of a, a, implies that it's some sort of simplistic routine work. It's education. It's how we think through complex decisions. I think in teacher education, I would like to see... One year is not enough. And I know we're looking for shorter and shorter periods. But I think we need... People, pre-service teachers need a kind of education that lets them think about about the big questions about education, the big questions about why is it that significant numbers of black students in my class aren't performing well. What are those issues? It's not just about teaching content. Now, teaching content is important, and I think teachers need those content. Oh, it's red. Um, so I think that we do have to broaden what we sense of what teachers need to know to become outstanding and what's the term is being used in, in Australia, classroom ready. So in conclusion, and, I, and I'm going to steal from um, Michael Fielding, that I think the situation is such at the moment in the way in which teachers work is regarded, in the way in which teachers are being viewed, that we have no alternative but to think about alternatives. And I think that in part that means rethinking what schools look like for both teachers and students. Thanks. Thank you, Martin. And for another international perspective, Lucy. Thank you, Becky. Um, I'm actually going to start a little bit differently from, from what I had planned, and that's picking up on something you said, Becky, right at the beginning. You referred to teaching as a vocation. And I thought that was very interesting and wonder, you know, why you chose that particular word. I do think that teaching is a vocation um, and that is something that, that most people who teach are called to do it. It's something that's really important. There's a moral element to it, certainly. But I also think that if we want to have more people applying to teaching, um, we need to think of it as a profession. We need to treat it as a profession. And I don't think that we do that in this country at the moment. So if you think about um, the standard definition of a profession is typically there will be some body of specialised knowledge that a group of people will have mastered, be able to use and apply for, um, for public, public service. Um, and I think the way that we've gone in this country is through deregulating um, teacher education, um, through making it possible to teach without having a teaching qualification. What really is being said is it's not a profession. You don't need to know anything other than have a history degree to teach history. And I think that actually lowers the status of the profession. Um, and that's not just, I think, um, I'm going to try and illustrate this with a, with a series of case studies from a few countries that I've spent time in um, and I've been teaching in. Obviously, I am going to talk about Finland, <laughs> but I won't just talk about Finland. So, um, so let, let's, let's start with Finland, though, um, because they've been, I suppose, doing this the longest. So they do have a, a cultural um, bit of cultural help here um, in the sense that because Finland was under the occupation of the Swedes and the Russians, teachers were seen as being nation builders. So they were the ones that were going to re retain the sense of Finnishness um, in the children in, in the nation. But, but that's not all. So, um, so even before, um, in, in the 1970s, they decided to move, um, to shut down teacher training colleges and move teacher training into eight prestigious universities, deliberately because they wanted to recognise that teaching is really important and requires um, academic study, as well as application of that in teacher training schools um, and, and then raising those entry requirements when they did that it didn't have an adverse effect on applications um, and in fact they now have in pr at the primary level um, as Mary said they've got about you know um, nine people applying for every place in, in Helsinki um, now you might think based on what I've said about the Finnishness idea that well it's easy for Finland sure no big deal. It's the culture. It's not because of anything else they've done. But let's look at something else which might question that. Um, staying in Finland for now. That was primary education we just spoke about. Um, primary education, you have to do five years, master's degree level study. Um, to be a secondary school teacher, though, you just have to do one year um, postgrad after your initial undergraduate degree. And actually, if you talk to, to Finnish teacher trainers, to Finnish policymakers, they will say it's not as prestigious as primary. There aren't as many people applying. Even Finland have some shortages in certain areas in, in maths and physics. So it's not just the case that it's, you know, teachers are super respected. I don't believe I just said super respected at the IOA. <laughs> <laughs> Very respected. <laughs> um, it's also because of the policies that they are um, 
um, putting forward. Chicago, um, just to give you another example, they took a risk in, in raising entry requirements for teacher training, um, and it is a risk, and their applications went up. Because if people see it as being something which is selective and therefore prestigious, whether or not teacher training even helps, the, this idea that you have to have training to do it and it is selective um, and you have to pass a test to get in um, means that more people um, then therefore value it. Um, just briefly, I want to talk about when that selectivity happens. Um, one, one approach is to do that on entry to teacher education as the Finns do. Um, Japanese, on the other hand, have a test at the end of their um, teacher education to go into schools, which is very difficult, notoriously very difficult to become a teacher in Japan. What that means, though, is while teaching might be prestigious, teacher education courses aren't because it's easy enough to get into a teacher education course. Um, a career is a very interesting one to look at. I mean, in a, in a context here where it's very difficult to do randomised control trials, we have to take what we've got um, in terms of natural experiments. And if you look at the situation in Korea, um, South Korea, um, primary education is quite, quite similar to Finland in that they are quite selective about how many people do it. They only take on enough people to fill the places that they'll need. Um, it's very prestigious. At the secondary level, though, um, Lots of people still want to be teachers because teachers are, are well paid in Korea. Um, but because um, there isn't a limit on how many people can do it, lots of different universities have offered lots of places. Lots of people who want to do the training now can't get jobs. It's now putting off some of the, the kind of higher, more qualified applicants from doing it because it's not as prestigious anymore. Um, so, fine. Not easy still for us, perhaps, because if we were to suddenly say, right, actually, no, you now have to pass this really difficult test to get onto teacher training, it might not be it enough. It might not be enough for us. Um, so let's look at Singapore, because Singapore um, have done a very clever thing in one and a half minutes. Um, so I think we put too much emphasis on, um, on the culture. When we're thinking about these top performing systems, we think, oh, it's easy for China, or it's easy for Singapore, because teachers are respected in China, teachers are respected in Singapore. But that is, is not straightforwardly the case. Um, so there are still huge teacher shortages in, in the countryside, in, in many parts of China, for example, um, because you have better working conditions in the cities. Um, in Singapore, there used to be such a teacher shortage that they were doing what England's doing now, and they were putting out posters in, in England and Canada and Australia saying, come and teach in Singapore. Um, so, so what Singapore did, if you can't get you know, your top, top graduates, whatever that means, to apply right from the outset and to do a five-year training course right from the outset, what you can do is have different routes into the profession, um, as we do here, um, but all of theirs are at least one year um, is one year postgraduate or two years after high school. But you, what you can do is rather than say, right, that's it, that's training, off you go, is recognise that that's just the beginning of teacher education. Um, and you've just got enough to go into schools, but you're going to be very um, carefully supported by what they call master teachers. They have a, a teacher career structure, which means that you don't just potter on through teaching, not that anyone in teaching potters, it's really hard. Um, and I haven't spoken about all the retention stuff, so I'm, hopefully that will come up in the, in the discussion. But you, you're expected to keep learning, to keep improving your practice. You have people supporting you to do that, watching your lessons, giving you feedback that's formative rather than summative. Um, and so that, that's an alternative way of making teaching prestigious, even if you can't get everyone um, to, to agree with you that it is right from the very outset. So I'll, I'll leave it there, but I'd love to talk about retention a bit and what they do in these countries, if anyone would like to. Thanks, Anne. <laughs> Thanks so much, Lucy. <laughs> and last but not least, Jonathan. Uh, thank you very much. So I want to, to talk about a couple of things, largely based on a very large-scale international survey uh, which the Varki Foundation did in 2013, which we are about to repeat in 2018, around what the public around the world think about teacher status and what they think about teaching as a profession. Um, and what that found, and I'll focus just on the, on the UK, the, the survey looked at 21 countries around the world, um, and what that found was that in the UK, teaching was stubbornly a mid-ranking status uh, profession. So we allowed respondents to define what they mean by status, um, but we gave them a list of 14 professions uh, and they had to rank them in order. And teaching came seventh out of 14. Um, when we asked people what they most commonly compare teachers to, they said social workers and librarians. 
Um, then we asked people about pay, because in many countries around the world, for better or worse, status tends to be correlated with pay. Um, and we asked people what they think teachers were paid as a starting salary. And actually in the UK, and this was in 2013, before the kind of pay slowdown, the general public thinks teachers are a lot better paid than they are. Um, so people think that teachers are relatively high paid, but still thought they were only moderate status. And the third dimension we looked at was trust. Uh, where, again, the, the academic evidence would tell you that higher trusted professions are higher status. Uh, and people think, in the, in the survey, and, and lots of other evidence also backs this up, that teachers are a very, very trusted profession. Uh, so the Ipsos Mori Veracity Index came out, I think, the other week, and teachers were third. They're pretty consistently first, second, or third, uh, right up at the top, along with doctors, um, and I, th I, think, I think clerics. And, yeah, journalists are <laughs> maybe not quite third uh, from, from bottom. Uh, and only, only, only policy exchange staff come lower. Um, and what this shows us is that it's really hard to do. You know, actually, nowhere in the world, other than in China, in our survey, did actually teaching come out as high status. So we polled in Finland, and we polled in South Korea, and we polled in Singapore, and with the sole exception of China, nowhere did the general public think that teaching is a high status profession. They thought it was mid to low status, uh, other, than, other than in China, where for whatever reason, and we didn't go into why, um, people thought it came out as very high status. So <clears throat> the first point is this is, this is a hard nut to crack. Um, and I guess the second related point is, in the UK, actually, I don't think it is true that there ever was a golden age of teacher status. So people occasionally sort of think, well, you know, 50 years ago, teaching was high status and high respected. But actually, I'm not sure that is particularly true. And actually, if you look back, if you think of the sort of mass expansion of teacher education in the 50s and 60s, actually, if you look at what people were saying at the time, there were very, very similar concerns being raised around the status of teaching. So, for example, one report in 1973 criticised teaching in the UK on four grounds. Uh, it is not glamorous compared to medicine. It has less mystique because most people know teachers. Um, there are lower qualifications to get into it. And uh, there is low workload and long holidays, was one of the other things that was quoted in, in 1973. And again, for better or worse, if you poll people in the UK now, that will be a conscious or subconscious thing that people say about teachers, that they work, sh maybe not they work short hours, but that they have long holidays. So I think the point I'm making here is, is that we are starting at the bottom of a very long hill, and it is not true to say that there was a golden age, certainly in the UK, where everybody really respect teachers. Ever since teaching has become a massified profession, we have not had a high status in this country. And if I think of all the period of time I spent in government, I spent uh, about 12 years in government working on education policy with uh, all three of the major political parties. Um, I suppose we should probably consider the DUP the full, most powerful political party in the country now. Uh, but I've, I've yet to work with them. Um, I have that pleasure to come. Um, the, the two most common questions I used to get asked were, one, how do we make vocational education uh, equivalent to academic education? And secondly, how do we boost prof uh, teaching as a profession? And the honest answer is that nobody knows about either of those things. And if I had a pound for every time that a government minister raised that as an issue, uh, and if I had a cut of every amount of public money that was spent on both of those issues, I'd be a very, very rich man. And the, the truth is that we don't really know how to do it. Um, so this is my kind of optimistic spin of the day. And, you know, it is true, as Lucy says, there are other countries that do it better. And, uh, you know, I, I actually agree with a lot of what Mary said, that there are, there are some things that can be done. I think there is something definitely around workload. I think there is potentially even something around the accountability system. So there are things that can be done, but we shouldn't kid ourselves that this is something that can be kind of, we can click our fingers and do, particularly in this very laissez-faire system we have, where the honest truth is that what impacts most teachers on a day-to-day -day basis is their immediate line manager and then their head teacher, if those people aren't one and the same thing. Actually, the impact of government policy for better or worse, on most teachers in the short to medium term, is almost zero. Because by the time it filters through all the various different pathways, good heads will interpret it in a productive way, bad heads will interpret it in a terrible way, some things are just good or bad ideas, full stop. But it's, it's really about the things that goes on in thousands and tens of thousands of classrooms every single day amongst 450,000 teachers. That's what makes the system change. Uh, and it's, it's very, very hard for government to actually do anything about that. Um, I think the last thing I want to end with is we need to kind of confront a few uncomfortable truths here, which is there are not enough people going into teaching and almost never have we had enough people going into teaching. Even at the peak, we were falling short in key subjects. And as, and as Lucy said, even in high-performing countries around the world, STEM subjects in particular are a real challenge. This is not a UK-specific issue. This is an issue to do with shortage of a highly desirable, highly coveted labour market skill. So that's the first challenge. There aren't enough people. Secondly, the people that want to go into teaching don't go to teach where we want them to teach. 
by which I mean if we could wave a magic wand as policymakers and as government, we would put them in schools that are not the ones they always want to go into. Now, that's fine, um, but that is a challenge we need to address. The third challenge is that even if we could find the amount of people to fill all the teacher training places we want, we can't afford to pay for them all. Actually, we, we, we would really struggle, actually cash-wise, as UK, <clears throat> to sustainably fill all of our teacher training places and pay them roughly what the labour market probably expects them to be paid. I would guess, and it's hard to put a figure on it, I would guess that the starting salary for teachers is roughly 10% under the kind of rate. Okay, you can argue about it, but I would say it's roughly that. Okay, so we spend £35 billion a year on teacher pay. So a 10% teacher increase is £3.5 billion a year. Um, that is not small change, and that's something you have to do year on year on year on year on year, and we're not just talking about starting salaries. So we don't have enough people, they're not where they want to be, and we don't have enough money for them. And if we could solve all of those challenges, we would have a significant detrimental economic effect on the rest of the economy. Because actually, if teaching took as many physics and maths graduates as it needed to, there are a lot of other equally socially valuable and economically valuable and morally valuable professions that also need those skills and wouldn't have them. So in a sense, what you might find is teaching cannibalising other professions. Okay? So we haven't got enough of them, we haven't got enough money to pay for them, we don't want them anyway, and they don't go where we want them to be. So, you know, if we could solve these problems, uh, we wouldn't be having this debate. But I think what we need to really then do is think about, and this is an area where I've, I've changed my mind potentially quite significantly, and I'll, and I'll leave it here. I always used to be a real sceptic of technology in education, um, and now I'm a sceptic of people who sell technology in education, um, but I am less of a sceptic about the possible technological solution to this. And it strikes me that in both healthcare and education, there must be a way in which we can complement human skill sets with technological skill sets. Uh, that is happening increasingly a lot uh, in, the, in the developing world, where we are 69 million teachers worldwide short. Um, and I think it may be something we need to look at quite systematically in the UK as well. And I'll leave it there. Thank you, John. Wow. Well, that was very thought-provoking, and we look forward to the debate. I'm really intrigued, actually. Um, we had lots of analysis of the challenge and let's face it the challenges are fairly formidable um, we also had various discussions and we touched on some potentially uh, radical solutions um, including obviously uh, potentially the use of technology um, we've talked a lot about um, potential professionalization is it about the status of teaching and so on um, this is a, an important area of debate, and I'll be very interested to hear what the audience thinks. Of course, uh, thinking about professionalisation doesn't necessarily explain our loss and attrition of teachers from the workforce once they've joined. Um, and that's something that we have to hold on to as the other side of the coin there. Um, so that's a separate set of questions, if you like. The other thing that I think um, was only just briefly touched on by speakers was the point about um, the structures of the school. Obviously, this relates to uh, work on the one hand, but so, um, I'm minded, mindful very much from my own research how time and time again, timetable is the explanation for everything. Why you can do things, why you can't do things, notoriously... Um, it impacts on the school's capacity to employ teachers part-time, for example, um, and to, to engage more flexible working patterns and so on, which we know might open up extra um, avenues for the workforce. So I'm quite interested personally in the role of the organisation of schools, some of which isn't flexible, you know, it's a sort of systemic challenge, um, but some of which might be. So um, on that note, I'll just this up to the panel to give a very quick, you know, 30 second kind of impressions about extras on the back of the questions that I've asked, and then we'll open it up to the audience. Mary, do you have any extra thoughts? Um, well, just, I, I actually agree with most of what Jonathan said, so that well, must be a first <laughs> that we've managed here. Uh, but I disagree on one thing really completely, which is that uh, when he says that government policy hasn't impacted upon teachers, it absolutely has. Every time you... Ch so what this government has done is introduced a new curriculum, uh, a new set of assessments, both at primary and secondary. Every time you introduce a new curriculum, you've got eons of work for teachers as they go through all their lesson plans, all their schemes of work. 
Then you introduce new GCSEs, AS and A levels uh, with a completely insufficient leading time and with, um, with, uh, um, without textbooks and without um, training materials. And that just is eons and eons of hours of work for them as well. And, um, and I think this England in particular... Uh, government policy has been characterised by a mad rush. I mean, you talk to Nick Gibb, and he says, well, we had to do it all quickly, Mary, but now it's all done and we don't need to change it. Good policy doesn't work like that. And you look to, you look to jurisdictions which do, teach your, you do, which do education policy well, and what they do is they spend enough time to do the consultation properly, to get it right to think carefully, and then to put that policy in place for about 10 years. And if you look at Japan, you look at Shanghai, you look at Finland, you look at all those places. You talk to Andrew Schleicher. You want to change your textbook in Japan. There's one textbook per subject. The reason why everyone buys into that is because it's been properly consulted. It's had proper input from the profession and from the experts. And if you want to change it, that's a 10-year program. So we've got to think about longer term education reform and I think government policies had a huge impact on the profession. That's before you even get into school structures and pay and the intensification of work and data all of which go back to the belief that if we don't have these metrics the system is not performing and in the end what's happened is the metrics is driving the system away from effective performance. Mary Martin. Mm. Uh, thanks, Mary. Um, look, I, I agree. Education policy is done by the election cycle, in, where I, I come from. Every time there's a new election, there's a new policy cycle that comes into play, and teachers are expected to change their practices again, as Mary, Mary said, in relation to a whole range of, um, of processes around assessment, pedagogy and the like. I, th I do think, and, it's, and, and probably if I'd have had longer, would have said much more about it, I sometimes think that if we want to make teaching a much more um, attractive proposition, we might need to get rid of schools, or schools as we know them. Um, schools in relation to what Tyak and Tobin have referred to as the grammar of schooling. And I say it, I guess, to, to, be, to be provocative. But I think, think places like learning centres, or places where young people go to learn and teachers work with them around learning, dealing with real life um, life problems I, and, and issues. I've done a lot of interviews with teachers both here and in Australia around um, alternative schooling and one of the things that comes up over and over again when you interview the teachers is that many of those teachers have gone into alternative schooling for the very same reasons as the students went into alternative schooling because they weren't coping or weren't getting satisfaction from, the, from working in some of the schools. I remember interviewing one teacher, a and, and really lovely young man, who said, I suddenly found myself shouting at the kids. That's not why I came into teaching. And, it wasn't, and I could understand why the kids were behaving in the particular ways they were. I didn't come in to check on the colour of their socks. I didn't come in to give them detentions because they were late to school because they had caring responsibilities at home. There was a whole range of ways in which I think the particular structures of schooling actually can work against the enjoyment and, practice, and, and teaching practices, the very reasons why people go into schooling. So I think that's still for me as a key issue. Thanks, Martin. Mm. Thank you. I've actually got... Um, can I pick up on the workload thing? Um, I just had a little look at some Tyler's data on the train. Um, and I will, I will talk about Finland again because they're just, you know, they're kind of a classic example, perhaps, of a way to do things differently. Um, but we actually, teachers in England, teach teach the same amount of hours a week in terms of teacher report um, as teachers do in Finland. So it's not that we're teaching any less, but um, hours we spend planning, on average, teachers in England are still spending eight hours a week planning compared to five in Finland, um, and six hours a week on marking compared to three in Finland. Um, so teachers in England have one of the highest workloads of all of the 35 countries that take part in TALIS. And it's not because of how much we're teaching, it's how much extra stuff we're doing. And just to pick up um, a little bit on the planning thing and link it back into this, this concept of, of professionalisation as well. Um, what you have in Finland, what you have in Japan, as Mary said, what you have in Singapore is some high-quality teacher-designed textbooks and a, a, a choice of them to be actually in, in most countries, but that are 
high quality that are based on students mastering the cer certain concepts and being motivating for students and talking to teachers in Finland about this and they said well why on earth would you not use a textbook they're really good I, who has a time to go and plan their own all of their own stuff so they use them as a basis for some some really good lessons um and whereas somehow we have this idea i think in this country i don't know where it's come from but that you're not teaching a good lesson unless you have designed your own powerpoint made your own flashcards and it's all completely you um and that's i don't think actually i'm not saying that teachers aren't professional but that's not a professional way of behaving because if you think about doctors they're not like oh i'm going to design my own method to deliver this child or I'm going to design my own drug let's see what happens when I do this it might some of them some of them will do that but it will be the most experienced doctors very carefully thinking about it it'll be the master teacher equivalents that I was talking about in Singapore so I think I think we need to, to stop thinking that teachers need to do everything have a teacher a proper teacher career structure and the Charter College of Teachers are, are making of teaching sorry are making um, Way, a way for this in terms of this new chartered teacher status so I'm quite excited about the possibilities for that but I think that would be a way to both enhance status and reduce workload for teachers oh, so, so I'm so nice about Mary as well um, so, uh, <laughs> so you did and, 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 then, and then spent a minute dis disagreeing um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a rhetorical trick you learned from Michael Gove I think wasn't it in that way um, so I, I, don't, I don't want to get onto government policy because that's a whole separate issue, but I profoundly disagree with a kind of moratorium on government policy. I think that is uh, a terrible idea for all number of reasons, which nobody agrees with me on, um, fortunately, other than the government. Uh, so I, I, don't, I don't think that's the right way to have high status. I think that risks preserving an aspic everything good and bad about the current system. And I think a sort of a deadline that says, well, look, we can't change anything for 10 years, we're stuck with it, is actually in many ways the worst thing we could do about making teaching a high status profession. That's not the same as saying we'll change everything every five minutes and I agree there has been too much change too quickly but I don't think a moratorium is the right way of doing that and um, I think the only other point I sort of I, I'm reflecting on is there's a sort of there's a, there's a trade-off really isn't there between pay and workload and class size and, and those are clearly three issues which really impact the professional status of teachers and I agree and I think there was a piece of research that came out I think this week out of IOE that, that looked at Talis data and looked at kind of uh, the professionalism and the status of teachers, and I thought that was a, a really good piece. Um, I, I mean, honest, honest uh, assessment of, of, of how that works. And I think we need to think about, you know, the conscious choices we make as policymakers, yes, and as, and as head teachers about pay versus workload versus class size. You know, we can have higher paid teachers if we have fewer of them. We can have fewer of them if they teach more kids each. But if we want lower workload, then we either need more of them, which means paying them less, or it means having bigger class sizes. You, you can change kind of two of those variables rather than three, in, except in a magic world where you suddenly have much more money than you do. This is not a kind of there is no more money case except there is no more money, but in, in any scenario, you know, 3.5 billion just to get every year, just to get us to where we think we can stand still, to really change that takes more money than is feasible. So I think we just need to recognise that we are dealing with complicated trade-offs here. This is a very, very tricky area of public policy. When I said that government policy doesn't impact teachers, what I mean by that is you can see in schools, when you go into schools, the differential impact that happens. You can go into schools that are dealing with the same exams and the same curriculum and have tackled it a lot better than other schools. And that's because they're well-led and they're well-managed and they've managed to sort this out. And that's because the head teacher, he or she and his or her senior leadership team, have managed to take the best of these changes. And so that's what I mean by actually the major impact happens within the school and within the classroom. Like a magic money tree. Oh, it's back to the DUP again, yeah. quoted the 3.5 billion. I thought that would... Anyway, let's, um, let's open it up to you for your questions. Take them um, at a time. We've already got a, a hand up at the back there. Yes. One at the Um, thanks very much. Um, just picking up on that issue of, of leadership, how, how much do you think teacher retention issues would be addressed through better succession planning and leadership development and better quality leadership throughout schools in England? Yes, perhaps an extension of that. The thing that has always puzzled me relates to something that Mary talked about, which is CPD. Um, and throughout my career, we've had people coming forward saying, 
what we need is a more coherent CPD system, more coherent link between initial training uh, and con early and continuous uh, professional development. Uh, and it's never happened. And I'd, <clears throat> I'd like to believe that the Chartered College of Teaching was going to do it. Uh, but history is not with it in, in, in that respect. So I wonder what the panel think of the reasons why even governments have come in said they're going to tackle that, like the Blair government, um, have either failed or copped out of it. Um, yeah, my comment is, or question, is actually related to the first one about school leadership. And um, one of the things that I'm struck by, um, I work with a great many schools in London, um, is the impact that the head teacher and school leadership team has on staff retention. Um, and I'd be interested to know whether you think that that is something that should be taken into consideration when head teachers are praised and judged. Um, I, I'm, I'm mindful of uh, the comment by Sir Michael Wilshaw some time ago, the famous quote when he said, you know you're doing something right when staff morale is at rock bottom. And, uh, uh, you know, I think that's very unhelpful, obviously. Um, and I just wonder what you think about how we change that. There are some head teachers out there who are exceptionally good at retaining staff and keeping staff morale high. And then there are head teachers, and I won't even bore you with the many, many horror stories that I hear on a regular basis who do quite the opposite. Thank you very much. So some really good questions. Um, first of all, about leadership and the quality and impact of leadership, and then separately on um, CPD. Who'd like to start with leadership? Sorry. Um, I, I think that um, we really need to think about leadership. We really need to think about what school leadership means. I think that... Um, We've, we've got, over the past, since 2010, since the Academy's programme has, um, you know, snowballed, leadership has become a very corporate activity in too many schools. Uh, and uh, you're running an organisation with a multi-million pound turnover, if you're in an academy chain, many millions of pounds of turnover. And uh, you've got to get that right and you've got to get the money right. And... Um, what that ha and, 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 and on top of that, on top of leaders head has been poured a tsunami of education policy reform and an awful lot of um, uh, um, da data they've got to provide and, um, and accountability mechanisms which are now incoherent really and overlapping, um, particularly at present with RSCs and Ofsted. So there's, there's, there's a lot that school leaders have to do and the danger in that situation when you feel overwhelmed and often fearful uh, you get a lot of school leaders who talk secret teacher and, and write about the fear of the job will last as long as the next offset infection. What you get a lot in those places is that you're so overwhelmed, you pass pressure down. And um, Becky Allen, Education Data Lab, who's coming to the Institute, she's done some very good work on schools which just burn out beginning teachers. And there's, um, there's quite a lot of research now and of schools and particular academy chains where it's well known in the profession, don't go there because there'll be no account taken of your life and of your workload and you'll just be burned out. So effective leadership does two things, I think. First of all, it sets a very clear strategic vision about what it is that we as a community, because schools are communities, what it is that we want to do in the world? What is it that we want to do for our children and young people? And, how, and then the operation comes from that, is how we're going to do it. And secondly, uh, in schools, and I think in any organisation really, and when I was a senior leader in a school, and then I was in teacher training, and now I'm a head of a union, uh, my first thing is that my, one of my key jobs is to look after the people who work for me. And by looking after them, I don't mean cuddly let's just be kind, although I do try and be kind, but it's how, thinking really hard about how can they do their work most effectively and what do they need to do their work most effectively. It doesn't mean they get everything they want, but it means that you've done that thinking. If you do that, I always said about teachers, if I, uh, when I was um, head of school, if you look after your lecturers or you look after your teachers, they will look after the students and the pupils. So staff welfare and staff well-being 
is really key. And that's not a cuddly mindfulness session, Ed. And um, it's not a cuddly sort of uh, let's be nice. It's actually thinking about the, um, what you are asking them to do. So I think that in too many schools, for example, data has just become a monster out of control. And you have teachers producing spurious data, going to data um, meetings where they are demanded to show progression. And you get, particularly in primary but increasingly in secondary, drowning in data which is being produced to satisfy the demands of an accountability system which doesn't know which way is up and doesn't know how to address quality other than through spurious data. And, it's, and you're drowning it, and that's what people tell me. So as a leader, the most difficult thing to do is make choices. Make choices about what you shoulder yourself, what you ignore, and what you say to your professional colleagues, no, we have to do this, but if you ask them to do something, make sure there's a moral and an ethical um, basis for saying that, even if it is, in the end, we've got to do the bloody stuff because otherwise we'll fail our offset inspection. That may be the only reason you can put there, but then try and think the best way to do that, which actually allows teachers to focus on being professionals. And I'll finish with this. In the end, in the end, we either, as school leaders and as leaders, enable our staff to be professional or they become drones. And we've got too many schools which haven't got that sorted. <laughs> so, so uh, briefly, I think, I think the three questions are related. And, and do we have effective leaders and, and why don't we get good CPD and, and what does that mean for retention? So the NFER work on retention shows that about five in ten people who leave a teaching job um, or leave teaching stay in education. It's the most popular career choice by far. Um, kind of rather surprisingly, a lot of them become teaching assistants, um, which suggests to me essentially they're kind of burning out. They love their job, they love teaching, they love being around kids, but they can't handle the, the workload and they're prepared to take, you know, what's a pretty significant pay cut to become a TA. And what that says to me is that it's bad leadership in those schools. Uh, that's why people, if they want to stay in professional, they move between teachers. One of the things I've always thought, um, present company excluded, is that the teaching union leaders have been less effective than the head teacher union leaders at selling a story. Um, within government, over the past 10, 15 years or so, the head teacher unions are seen as easier to deal with, they are seen as a more fair arbiter, and they are seen as people who you can, don't have a vested interest. And I think they have sold a good pass at telling us that we have a high quality school leadership in this country, and the problem is with the teaching workforce. And I think we have a lot more poor leaders in this country than the head teacher unions have successfully convinced government otherwise. And I think that is the problem we face. Um, because if you can have a good head teacher, he or she magnifies goodness. If you have a bad head teacher, he or she magnifies badness. Um, how's that for quality English at the IOE? Um, <laughs> but I think that also links to this point about why, why CPD isn't done. Um, you know, if I think about when I was in government and we were thinking about, you know, large-scale CPD schemes, we were thinking about the, the teacher sabbaticals, which uh, NUT, as was at the time, were pushing quite heavily. We were thinking about kind of additional time off timetable, you know, really doing some systematic increase of teacher CPD. Um, why didn't we do it in the end? Number one, because it's really, really expensive. Um, and number two, bluntly, because governments of all stripe have been badly, badly burned by large-scale top-down initiatives that don't work, because um, bluntly, governments don't trust all school leaders and all school teachers to do it right. And the risk was that if you suddenly give everyone 10% off timetable, you'll spend a fortune because you need to cover that and you won't really get systematic improvements. Uh, and, and unless you can sort of square that circle, that's why uh, we're not going to get it. Thanks, Jonathan. A uh, word from Lucy on CPD? Um, yeah, just, um, just very briefly, perhaps, I mean, and I'm, I'm not an expert on this country, or any country really, I'm a generalist, <laughs> I'm a generalist, <laughs> but perhaps why, why that hasn't that link, ITT through CPD hasn't worked, is because it hasn't been tied into a career structure, um, in terms of, you know, thinking about teacher motivation, um, if I'm very busy, I'm, I think all teachers do want to get better, but if I'm very busy, I'm not going to, to make the time necessarily to, to work on my teaching or develop something if a, I haven't got any particular reason to be doing it in terms of I want to become someone who's going to take additional responsibility for supporting colleagues you know I'm aiming for something in particular um, I'm all, and b I haven't got those colleagues who are already in that position supporting me to do it um, I've, I've seen some really really good practice in this um, respect in New York um, 
which is not a top performing system, but have a, a program called um, a Teacher Leadership, Teacher Career Pathways, where rather than doing um, top down, it, it has come from the government, but it's small scale, it's not across the whole city. They've just started with um, opening a, a program for people to apply to be teacher leaders giving them some training in how to facilitate colleagues um, using professional inquiry and then r avoiding some of the, the contentious issues around right, what actually are we saying is good teaching because that's another, I think, a reason why we haven't got there is because I think Twitter doesn't help, to be honest. But people get opposed into different camps of this is good teaching and that's good teaching and it's just a massive oversimplification and it stops us getting anywhere else. Um, so, those, yeah, that's my... Thank you, Lucy. My thoughts. And Martin, you want just, to... Just a, a minor point or a small comment on, on leadership. I, I was involved in a really large study in, um, in Queensland which led to significant reform around, around pedagogy. Mm -hmm. And one of the things we looked at was schools which were really, I guess, going against the trend in terms of outstanding forms of pedagogy. And we looked at leadership in those schools. And what was a common factor across, the, across those, that set of schools was a rejection of deficit views of teachers. So the principals actually trusted the teachers and they worked to disperse leadership across the schools. And so there was this sense of, within the school, of rejecting deficit understandings of teachers, but also teachers rejecting deficit understandings of, of students. And we looked in some of those, those classrooms and what we, what we saw, and when we talked to the teachers, we found that many of those teachers were also interested in students beyond their own classroom. So students in the school, students maybe within the state about how they could improve the education for those students. So they weren't actually competing against each other but supporting and working with each other. Um, there was an also a sense in which these teachers were interested in their own learning and were encouraged, and so this I guess taps into the, the CPD, that there was an encouragement and a finding of resources somewhere within the school to ensure that teachers who were, had a particular interest, and it might have been in something like multi-age classrooms or philosophy of educa in education as a practice, and somehow there was CPD opportunities found for those teachers, and that came from, I guess, from the, from the top. Yeah, that's really interesting and obviously a sort of key facet of professionalisation as well, the notion of the teacher as an ongoing learner. Um, I've got a couple of comments and questions uh, from people watching on the live stream. Um, there is a comment from at T Lady June who says um, the best solution to teaching recruitment crisis would be to ensure experienced teachers are happy in their jobs, best advertising possible. So that's our nirvana, I, I guess. Um, we have a question from at Alison Milner, 33. Why has no one mentioned the role of Finnish teachers' union? This is one for you, maybe, Mary. Uh, teachers as social partners in the policy process is central central to their status in Finland. Um, that seems a bit like a comment as well. And um, then we have um, a question from E.W. Inchip for, um, or E. Winship maybe, for uh, Jonathan, um, asking about this notion that increased teacher intake uh, equates to increased cost. Where have you got your evidence from? Um, so maybe Jonathan can uh, answer that one anyway. Uh, because more more people need paying, and that costs more money. It's just logic, is your is your answer? And, 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 I mean, unless I'm unless I'm missing something. If you need more teachers, unless you pay all your existing teachers less, you need to increase your total pay bill. Thank you. That 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 fulsomely answers that question. I think um, we've got um, a couple more questions here. Uh, Matt, Ed, Mark. So, Matt first. Do you want to say who you are and where you're from as well? We should be doing good practice. All right. Oh, um, sorry. Okay, there's two mats maybe. Uh, okay, um, my name is Richard Lewis. Oh. Um, I'm slightly unusual in that I've actually spent 30 years in management consultancy and come into teaching um, as my second profession, sort of my retirement profession. So I take a um, almost management consultants approach looking at teaching and the teaching profession. Um, a lot of things I could comment on, but there are just two things I think that are worth bringing out, and you have talked about leadership, um, and I think it really is worth emphasising that my experience, I mean, I've spent my life doing leadership for various projects with probably the most difficult people in the world are consultants, and it just strikes me that people that move into leadership in schools 
have been given next to no training in how to be leaders. So they basically are managers, and you get an awful lot who think that the way you move into leadership is to tell teachers what to do. Right? You treat them like children. Well, actually worse than children, because actually you wouldn't treat their own students that way. Um, I think the other thing is um, Mary just used, very slipped in the word Ofsted. Um, now, I'm not aiming to blame Ofsted, but I do think the way in which ma uh, management's SLT responds to what they think Ofsted wants, the shorter inspection times, the fact that um, now they have to expect to have all the data there, yeah, that, that all of that drives um, increased load, poor leadership um, in, in schools. Thank you, Richard. Matt, and I'm just sorry to be being draconian with people, but if we can keep questions short and responses short, we'll get more in. I'm Matt from the Institute for Teaching. Um, just want to challenge Jonathan, actually, on his uh, workload, uh, number of teachers in a classroom, number of kids. Um, like, I get that to a point, but I think there are two important pieces of that puzzle that are missing. What, and, and it speaks to your point about timetabling, um, which is one, if you increase the expertise of the teachers, you can increase the number of pupils that those teachers are able to teach. And we often miss that in our thinking. Um, and the second one is more closely linked to that point about expertise. Um, as a profession, we need to, I think, rethink, and I'd uh, like to hear your views on this, um, the breadth uh, of pupils and subjects that we teach and the frequency with which we move around. Um, it's still a mystery to me why primary school teachers move their class most years. Like, we don't, we don't need to do that. Why do we? Thanks, Matt. Hi, I'm Ed Doral from the TES. Uh, there are literally thousands, thousands of, uh, thousands of teachers watching uh, this live on our Facebook page, believe it or not. You're all celebrities. Um, <laughs> Yes, wave to your mum. Um, uh, one one of the uh, one of the teachers has just expressed outrage at Jonathan's comment about technology um, being a potential solution to this problem. Um, I, I'm minded to agree with the outrage. Are we talking about robots delivering scripted lessons here? Because um, I can't see how that would improve the professionalism of the uh, of of the profession. And quickly, I'll allow myself one question, which is. Setting to one side your lack of magic money tree, surely if we just pay teachers a lot more, especially classroom teachers on an escalator for how long they've been in the profession, how much CPD they've done, that would be possibly the easiest and best solution to this problem. Thank you very much. And we had, yeah. Um, hi, I'm uh, Mark Quinn. I'm at the IOE now, but was teaching for 22 years before I couldn't do it any longer. Um, it just strikes me that um, uh, we do government badly, it's, you know, not, not schools, but we do government badly, and um, we can't stop doing it, I think, from what Jonathan seems to uh, give us plenty of evidence of that. Um, I think we have, or at least we do, spend lots of money on education. Um, the extra 3.5, what did you say, 3.5 billion. We spend an awful lot of money on education, but only on the things that government thinks we should spend it on. And I think uh, all those teachers on Facebook watching could think of lots of different ways of spending that money. Um, I, I think government, and I don't mean particularly this government, but I think government hates teachers and distrusts leaders. Um, and that might be the simple solution to uh, how we could transform the profession if they could just stop doing that. Thank you very much. And we had one more here, and, and I'm, I'm going to actually take these um, points and questions all together and then share them out in a, in a, in a fulsome last round. Hello, um, my name's Gillian Hogg, and I'm not a teacher at all, but I'm quite interested in the profession. Um, one thing that struck me as interesting was when Lucy talked about the primary school um, having almost a higher prestige than secondary school, and another thing about the, the financial aspect the cost of illiteracy in terms of, you know, somebody was telling me how what the percentage of prisoners who are illiterate are. I, what do you feel about the and the way that the resources are put into those two areas? Thank you very much. Okay, so that's a wonderful array of questions. Um, and again, if colleagues can keep their answers brief and select um, a particular topic. Um, we've got the training of leaders, 
Uh, we've got the notion of the sort of equations in our models, uh, teachers to class size, subject areas, and so forth, and thinking differently about our structures. We've got uh, the role of technology and what that really looks like. Um, we've got uh, teacher pay, and again, coming back to this choice about what governments spend their money on. And then we've got the question about um, primary pr prestige for primary education. So I think if I ask panellists to take one issue to focus on and keep their answers brief, um, I'll start with you, Martin. We'll, we'll mix it up a so, bit. So, so, so I don't want to answer any of those questions. I want to respond, <laughs> I want to, respond to Tea Lady June um, and her quest comment about advertising. I think that I would love it to see the day when a student in a school says to a teacher, I'm thinking of being a corporate lawyer, and the teacher says, but you've got the abilities to be a teacher. You know, where else, like in schools, we have to be an advertising for our own profession, I think. We have, like, nobody else is in a school, like teachers, to be able to advocate for their profession, to talk to students about the benefits as well, as, as some of the difficulties of teaching. So I do think that we have to be advocates for our profession. Uh, I'm not going to answer. Well, the, somebody said so. So the gentleman in front said um, Ofsted, and uh, he wasn't really going to be against Ofsted. So, in order to wow the public and uh, give people a bit of what they want, I will be against Ofsted, and I'll go for it, red in tooth and claw. I think that um, the current accountability system is absolutely toxic to uh, the longevity of teachers' working lives and the building of their experience. Um, we have an accountability system which is desperately confused, uh, both in the metrics it uses, in the data it uses, also in the way that we hold schools to account, and desperately confused now between Ofsted and the RSCs, and um, about what the whole purpose of inspection is. We have an agency, Ofsted, who has a collective amnesia when it comes to its institutional memory. So Ofsted never said that they could judge whether a teacher was outstanding or otherwise in a 20-minute lesson. No, that never happened, and that's why our training programmes, when I was General Secretary of ATL, we used to run training pro programmes in how to show Ofsted excellence in 20 minutes, and we'd have teachers knocking the doors down. So Ofsted have been, you know, they, they've, Ofsted is an agency which is unreliable uh, in its inspection judgments, invalid in its inspection judgments, constantly searching around for an inspection framework which solves the problems of the last inspection framework but creates a whole lot of new ones, i.e. drowning in data. And, and, it has redu and, and when Chris Woodhead said in 1992 that Ofsted was to be a, an, an agency which, um, which provoked fear and loathing, well, he succeeded. And if we're going to treat the profession with respect and allow teachers to stay in the profession and develop to become effective middle and eff senior school leaders, we have to do accountability very differently. That's not we don't do accountability, but we do it differently. And Ofsted's not the answer, it's a problem. Thank you, Mary. Tell us what you really think, hey? <laughs> uh, Lucy. I'd like to share a stat that blew my mind. Um, this is from a, a book um, by a chap called Fenton Whelan that you should all have a look at called Lessons Learned. The factor that explains the most variance in PISA scores is student-teacher ratio, or the opposite way around from what you think. So it is the countries that have fewer teachers per student that do better. Why? Because if you have fewer teachers, you can be more selective, you can pay them more, you can put more money into their teacher education. Yes, that does mean you have bigger class sizes, but there are different things that go into that three-way um, triangle ratio thing. Um, we can reduce workload, um, and coming to, to Matt's point, one of the ways that they reduce workload, for example, in, in Shanghai, in fact, in most of the countries I visited, is you will not teach, as I did in my first year of teaching, year seven, year eight, year 10, year 11, year 12, and year 13. You will be a specialist in year seven and year eight maths. Um, so you will not be planning 18 lessons a week. You'll be planning perhaps four. Um, and that massively reduces your workload. Combined with um, a different style of accountability where it's supportive rather than punitive, that also reduces workload. So it is possible, and I do think that actually being more selective, more ambitious with what we, how we educate our teachers would, um, would help. Thanks, Lucy. And Jonathan? So, um, so let me take the, te the technology one. Uh, and despite Ed's oh-so-subtle uh, journalese, uh, no, I, I'm, I'm not advocating for robot teachers. Uh, and I'm pretty sure I said in my remarks it's about technology alongside uh, teachers. Um, 
So honestly, I, I don't know what the answer is in this space, and I don't have a kind of pre-planned uh, soundbite or policy idea that I dreamed up on the back of a, of a napkin. But it just it strikes me that, you know, I mean, it does make a change, yeah. I've, I've done that for too many years. You know, when we, when we think about the fact that worldwide there are 69 million teachers, fewer than we need, when we think about the fact that in, in many countries in the world there's a significant systemic failure of the system to produce enough people... When we think in many countries, particularly in the areas where there are the biggest teacher gaps, there are not enough graduates, even if every single graduate in the country in many parts of Africa became teachers, you still wouldn't fill those gaps. There's kind of two options, right? You can keep on turning the wheel and expecting suddenly, magically, 69 million more people to appear. You can radically change your notion of class sizes, and, and that takes you some of the way. Or you can start to think about what you do if you cannot ever have one person standing in front of 30 people, or, or a variant thereof. Now, I don't know what that answer is. Um, it is not about robot teachers, and in fact, all the kind of the analysis of automation says that teaching is about the least likely profession to be automated, because it's about the human touch and the personal relationships, and I totally agree with all of that. It just strikes me that there must be something to break through this knot of there just not being enough human capital, and there being no realistic possibility in any country, including this country, of meeting that shortfall and you have to do something about that thank you jonathan well that brings us um to with we've, we've timed out really it feels like only the start of a discussion actually rather than the end of one i don't think we've answered the question um but we have had lots of stimulating ideas both from um colleagues on the panel and indeed from the audience and i think the beginning of a conversation actually um something there about structures something there about professionalization something there about workload and accountability I imagine that we're already a buzz on social media on this discussion. It sounds as though we are from what Ed says. And so I look forward to uh, seeing the tweets and the other commentary later this evening and to continuing the conversation. Join me, please, in thanking our brilliant panellists for that input. <laughs> And thanks enormously to all of you for your comments and your contributions both here and online. Thanks again. Clap to you too. <laughs>